folks, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Carol Ann and I welcome you. Today we're going to be talking about the new world of adult bullies. And today we have with us Bill Eddy. He is a lawyer, a therapist, a mediator, and the co-founder and chief innovation officer of the High Conflict Institute. He's also the author of over 20 books and manuals about managing relationships and situations with high conflict people and bullies. He trains lawyers, judges, mediators, and therapists worldwide in managing high conflict situations. Now he is writing books for everyone, including his latest, Our New World of Bullies, How to Spot Them, How to Stop Them. So we're going to be talking about that book today. There are so many interesting topics. We will discuss what bullying is. According to the American Psychological Association, they define it this way. Bullying is a form of aggressive behavior in which someone intentionally and repeatedly causes another person injury or discomfort. Bullying can take the form of physical contact, words, or and more subtle actions. So today we're going to be discussing this topic in depth. I hope you enjoy it. Let's welcome Bill Eddy. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. As I explained in the intro, I have Bill Eddy with us today. He is from the High Conflict Institute. And I did give a brief uh, intro to you, Bill, but if you can kind of tell folks who you are, who you are and why we're here today, that would be brilliant. Sure, so my background first was as a, a licensed clinical social worker doing child and family counseling, but I liked mediating disputes and resolving conflicts and decided if I want to do a career with that, that I should go to law school. So I went to law school primarily to do mediation of disputes but I practiced family law for 15 years in family court, plus mediating disputes and, and some of that as a counselor. And all put together, I got into this theme of high conflict personalities, where people go, why are people fighting about this or that or the other thing? And so I started developing kind of a theory of high conflict personalities and a set of skills to use to help manage their conflicts. Then I co-founded High Conflict Institute in 2008 uh, with a business partner, Megan Hunter. And since then, I've really focused on training, training professionals, writing books, doing consultations and also co consulting with, with anyone because everyone's dealing with high conflict personalities and the most high conflict personalities are bullies. So that's how I got, got to here today. <laughs> yes, that's so true. Um, all right, let's get started. So you wrote a book. Uh, when was that published, Bill, recently, correct? Yes, so it was just published June 11th. So it's very fresh, it's less than a month old. And um, I wrote it over the last three years, starting really the end of 2020, when COVID was really going strong in its first year. So that kind of inspired some of why I wanted to explain why I think people are, bullies are coming out and getting more attention. Yeah, yeah. And the name of your book is our, um... Our New World of Adult Bullies, How to Spot Them, How to Stop Them, correct? That's correct. Yes, that's yeah. good. Sometimes it's hard to say how to spot them and how to stop them because it kind of rhymes, but that's a little different. But that's yeah. the goal is to learn how to do that. Absolutely. I read the book and I thought it was fantastic. It was full of so much insight. I was highlighting like crazy in there trying to remember <laughs> all the key points but let's get started. Um, you mentioned COVID. Now, I happen to have noticed that during that period, there were that there seemed to be a lot more bullying taking place, or at least people were a lot more open about it. So you said that's what prompted you to kind of or inspired you to kind of write the book. Yeah, I, I wanted to explain why our culture at this time seems to be presenting us with more bullies. 
and that people were losing their social skills and so people are going to run into more bullies and i wanted to prepare people for that and give them tips for how to manage those interactions so they don't make them worse because often people just escalate the situation when you really can calm it down and so that that was my goal in writing the book yeah because social media was such a great platform for folks to be able to do that too Yes, it's really, it's surprising, but social media is really a contributor in two ways, I think. One is it shows a lot of bullying and people react to that and bully each other online. But the other thing is bullies who used to be more isolated and kind of kept on the fringes of society unless they behave better now they're finding other bullies and through social media they're forming support groups to be as they are rather than to improve their behavior and so that was a surprising thing i learned in writing the book is that bullies are finding each other and encouraging each other's bad behavior instead of good behavior like aa and na and support groups you think of doing well, there are support groups for bullying, and that's really kind of scary. Yeah, it sure sounds it. Do you think it was because a lack of or or like people lost their social skills, or do you think it was just their innate personalities coming to surface? Well, I think mostly what we're seeing is people with bully personalities feeling freed up or unrestrained. Um, and some of the research suggests that online that not everybody's becoming a bully or becoming more hostile, but the people who already are that way are feeling comfortable expressing themselves a lot more. So, yeah, so their presence is more known, but most people, let's say 90% of people still manage themselves pretty well, but the five, five to 10% like this, um, just, you know, let go of trying to manage themselves. And that's one of the big messages of the book is that bullies lack self restraints. And so we have to take action to protect ourselves or to set limits on them. Now, in your book or in your bio, I forget where I read it, but the American Psychological Association defined bullying. And I, I read that to the folks so that they can kind of get a good idea. Can you give us your interpretation or is it exactly the same? Well, there's, there's several similar interpretations. And to me, it's basically when one person is acting in ways and speaking in ways that make another person quite uncomfortable, but also that there is there's a perceived power imbalance. So the person feels kind of trapped with that person's bullying behavior. But the key thing that I use in my definition is that they have a drive to dominate other people and that it's a pattern of behavior. It's usually not a single behavior, but an ongoing pattern, like bullying in, in a, a domestic violence relationship, or bullying at work, or bullying with neighbors, or bullying online, that there's a pattern to it, and the target of the bullying feels it, feels it uh, physically, emotionally, and and that it diminishes and and may be harmful to them so I, I put all that together but the key thing to me is this drive to dominate i also mentioned that i've been studying for the last 40 years high conflict personalities that have four key characteristics which bullies also have one's a preoccupation with blaming others and not taking responsibility. Second is a lot of all or nothing thinking. And you'll notice bullies discuss things from the extremes. Um, and the third is often unmanaged emotions. They're more likely to yell, to shove, to threaten, uh, to just be intimidating physically, like standing over your desk, talking down to you. 
And um, also they may engage in some extreme behaviors that most people wouldn't. So that's high conflict personalities and bullies have the most high conflict personalities because they add the drive to dominate or destroy other people, which is less common, but not unknown. Yeah, I unfortunately ran into my share of bullies in corporate America. Um, I noticed that with them, they were more like of a passive aggressive bullies. Yes. And, and one thing I like to say about passive aggressive behavior, like kicking you under the table and denying it above the table, um, is passive aggressive behavior is aggressive behavior. It's just they're trying to hide it. Um, but think of passive aggressive behavior as another form of aggressive behavior, which bullies do use a lot. And that's one of the differences of adult bullies compared to childhood bullies. And 90% of childhood bullies are done before they're adults. They don't do that as adults. But adult bullies are much more subtle, um, more manipulative, um, more words that they use to bully people. So we've, we've got to be aware of that. Yeah, definitely. Um, you mentioned in your book, uh, Pep, Pete, Peps, The Power of Primitive Emotions. Do you think that, like explain that to us so, so folks can know what that is and what it means. Yeah, so this is something that in many ways the book revolves around. And that is my realization, really, that bullies, like I like to say, bullies aren't evil, they're ancient. That they use, they activate primitive emotions in us that most people don't activate. And these are primitive emotions that human beings have, especially we're born with, but then we kind of, as we get raised, we learn to manage them and they become less significant in our lives, but bullies activate them. So there's three key primitive emotional powers, as I see it. One is they activate fear. So they're always telling you, you should be afraid. You should be afraid of yourself, like in a domestic violence case, like you're, you're an idiot and I have to protect you from yourself. You know, depend on me. Don't make your own decisions. I'll make them for you. Or fear of others, um, or just fear that the world is collapsing. You know, if you watch the evening news, you go, oh my goodness, the world's in terrible shape. Well, it's not in as bad shape as they show you because they're showing you the worst to get your attention. But anyway, so fear, bullies work a lot with fear. Also rage, rage is one of the, the um, primitive emotional systems that we're born with, kicking and screaming and all of that, but we learn to soften and manage that, most of us uh, in growing up. But you'll see bullies go into a rage. It's not unusual. And the third primitive emotion is what I call love loyalty, that the bully presents that, that they love you and they may love bomb you. They may just constantly, oh, you're so incredible. Oh, I love you so much. Blah, 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 blah. But what they really want is for you to be loyal to them. So it's love, loyalty. It's really they want you to be loyal so they can do whatever they want to you. And we see that in relationships, in the workplace. We see that in politics, international relations, that these same patterns of activating primitive, primitive emotional power is often how they take control of people. We hear a lot about, and, and especially the past few years, uh, everyone seems to be a narcissist. Uh, it's all over the internet. There's thousands of videos. Yet I see a very strong correlation between correlation between the characteristics of a narcissist and an adult bully. Can you kind of walk us through the differences and the correlations? Yeah. So first of all, most people aren't narcissists. Um, we live in a more individual, individualistic society than ever before. And so often people, you know, put that together with narcissism and say, well, he's self-centered or she doesn't pay attention. 
Um, and these are more uh, behaviors that are common that you know a lot of people have. Narcissistic personality disorder is much more severe in a smaller percentage of people. Um, this people say like two percent to six percent of the adult population may have this, and that involves putting people down. It involves being mean, humiliating people, um, stepping on people to get ahead. And so there are a percent of people, especially in the workplace, that we see that, that may have narcissistic personality disorder, which means it's dysfunctional. It gets in the way, actually, of them having friends and having lasting success. So it's a, it's a disorder. Now, with bullies, so I, I think bullies overlap with narcissistic personalities, with antisocial personalities, which I'll briefly explain, and borderline personalities, which I'll briefly explain. So those three personality disorders are in the diagnostic manual for mental health professionals. But people have, may have traits of those without having a disorder. Personality disorder means you're stuck in a narrow range of behavior that's dysfunctional and interpersonal. Now, with bullies, what we see is this drive to dominate kind of overlaps with the personality disorders. And so some people, I think, are narcissistic bullies who are trying to step on other people to get ahead. Some are antisocial bullies who are very aggressive, um, lie a lot, can be very deceitful and conning, and um, potentially dangerous, and lack remorse. So they'll say or do anything to get what they want. And so many of them are bullies, many narcissists are bullies, and many people with borderline personality. Now that's a range, an emotional range, a wide range of charming, friendly behavior, switching over to rage um, on a drop of a hat, and then switching back and being friendly and charming. And these kind of emotions have taken over. So they don't have emotional self-control or, or lack that. Some of what we see with people who are domestic violence perpetrators have this borderline uh, personality. So I see the bullies as having traits of one or more of these three personalities, but most narcissists aren't bullies. But most bullies, maybe a narcissist, antisocial, or borderline traits. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that with with some adult bullies, they seem to hone in on specific targets, specific people, because I've seen them be nice and charming and wonderful to like certain people, and then other people they bully the heck out of them. What's up with that? I think they really want to uh, dominate somebody or somebodies, and it isn't necessarily just one person. And sometimes in the workplace, you see this behavior, you go, okay, they're doing that to other people too. I'm going to find those other people, and then we're going to set some limits here. Um, so, but because they can be very charming, they often start out charming. And they may always be charming to people in power because that helps them get away with what they're doing to the people that don't have power. So I think of them as like kicking down and kissing up in an organization. And that makes it hard sometimes to, to fire bullies or to set limits on them because the people above them think, oh, he's wonderful. He, he, brings in a lot of business and he's just so charming and friendly and wonderful. And there's like 10 people that work for this person that go, why do they keep this guy? You know, he's terrible to us. He terrorizes us. He yells at us. He does all these things. So I think it's, it's that protective shield that they use to cover up in a way, the other side of their personality, the bully side. What about the personalities that they target? 
Well, but this is interesting because I really think they don't target specific personalities that they they target everybody, but they see how people respond. Mm -hmm. And so people with a passive response are more likely to have repeat bullying then. So, yeah, because what I what I found in researching this book, looking at a lot of examples is that they they'll just try everybody and most people brush them off and you know give me a break buddy and they leave that person alone but the person that's the deer in the headlights they go okay i got them i'm gonna pursue so someone who may have a more passive personality style may be more vulnerable to this but i like to say even in the book regardless of your personality style you can set limits and impose consequences as soon as you realize you're going to need to do that. So, yeah, so I wouldn't say there's really a target personality as much as just people being passive when they should be more assertive. Gotcha. Now, in your book, you stated that um, adult bullies don't and can't come to their senses and and catch themselves. And that after four decades of working with bullies and their victims, one of the most important lessons you learned is that many adult bullies are born that way and that others learn to be bullies in early childhood through abuse or indulgence or both. And that bullying is not just something they do. It defines who they are. I thought that was such a powerful paragraph. Give us your thoughts on that. Yeah, it really is surprising to people that they don't realize there's a percent of people, and I think of it as around 5%, but maybe it's a little higher, who really have a personality that this is part of who they are. And I think many people are born this way, or at least with these tendencies. And this goes with my theory that bullies are actually ancient personalities and that they use these primitive emotional powers, which if you go back thousands of years, were really helpful to survival and groups working together around a bully leader. Bullies pull people together as well as split them into two groups usually, but each group is pretty tight knit. And so I think that that that's why these bully genetic tendencies have existed uh, throughout history into the present because they tend to push people because they lack the empathy that narcissists lack they lack remorse that antisocials lack they lack the emotional self-control and so they push beyond they do things that will upset people and ironically, sometimes that helps make human progress. And so, you know, we split and then there's a war and one side wins. And then, you know, we like one step forward, one step back, somehow two steps forward every so often. So I think that's part of it. Also, early childhood is a big part for some bullies. If they were terribly bullied as a child um, or abused, that they see that's the way life is. And so you're going to either be the person that hits or be the person that gets hit. Likewise, the, the child that's indulged and is allowed to do whatever they want and steal their friends' toys and hit their friends and the parents laugh. And, and so they're encouraged. And, and we're seeing more of that today as well. So those three causes, I think, have led to the people that grow up as bullies. It sounds very sociopathic to me. Is, is there a connection? Yeah, well, sociopath and antisocial are pretty much the same personality type. So antisocial is the words used in the mental health manual and sociopaths, the word used more by police and, and detective story writers, for sure. Um, there's technically some subtle differences that may be that sociopaths can have empathy for their family, but be willing to kill other people. You think of the mafia, stuff like that, probably a lot of sociopaths there. Um, 
Antisocial, one of the characteristics is this lack of empathy and remorse uh, for everybody. And so maybe sociopath is one step less worse than antisocial, but the, the diagnostic manual says they're pretty much the same thing. Right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's so interesting. Let's talk about turning the tables on these bullies. You, you have six strategies that you mention in your book to do that. And one, one thing you mentioned that I thought was very interesting, uh, and maybe you could give us your thoughts on it. You said never to tell a bully that they're a bully. Is that right? And why? Right. So, so the six strategies, the first is recognize you're dealing with a bully. And when you recognize that, there's some things you don't want to do. First of all, you don't want to overreact and start being just like they are, or you look like a bully too. But you don't want to tell them you think they're a bully because bullies are very defensive. Um, and if you say you're a bully, they're going to get angry at that. They say, no, I'm not. You're the bully. And I've had that in cases where I've dealt with uh, with bullies. And early in early years, I'd say, oh, well, you're a bully. You need to cut it out. Nobody likes you because you're a bully. I'm just trying to help you here. And they go, you called me a bully. How dare you? And so I learned, don't do that. Focus on what to do now. That's more important. Um, you, you can't try to really give them insight into themselves. Um, and I list in the book, I, I take a list of high conflict personalities and 40 predictable behaviors. And a lot of them are that they lack self-awareness and you can't make them look at themselves. So you don't want to label them, say they're a bully, high conflict person, have a personality disorder. Just don't say any of that. Figure out what to do next. That's the most important thing. So once you realize you're dealing with someone with this pattern of behavior, those are things not to do and the things to do. Um, let's go into the next one, which is pull the plug on the bully. And that is look at how you might be supporting the bully. You might be agreeing to keep it secret that they came to work an hour late. And they said, you know, don't tell anybody I'm an hour late. And you go, oh, okay, sure, fine, no problem. And then it starts adding up. And then your division gets in trouble because work isn't getting done. And it's not getting done because this guy's an hour late every day. So pull the plug on that. Don't keep it secret. Say, hey, we got a problem. This guy's an hour late every day. You've got to deal with that. So talk to somebody. Um, don't keep it a secret. Don't become isolated. So that's pulling the plug on the bully. And I give many examples of people that were trying to keep bullying secret, and they saw the bully treating other people that way too, and they realized, I've got to tell somebody about this. And that, especially in the workplace, sometimes had bullies removed from positions of power. So that was important. I can be a little long winded. Let me know. I've done two strategies. I've got four to go. Should I just go on oh, with no, them it's, now? It's great. I think it's very helpful information. Go right ahead. Okay. So the third one is setting limits. Think about what can you tell them? Here's the line I don't want you to cross. Uh, like you can't talk to me that way. Um, you're talking or about somebody else. You, you can't talk to me that way. So that's setting a limit. But then you also, the fourth is you need to impose consequences. And this is where society at large isn't prepared for bullies because we say, hey, you got to cut that out and they keep going. And people go, oh, well, I told them, what can I do? I told them to cut it out and he's still doing it. Well, you have to have consequences. So in the workplace, sometimes it may be telling somebody, you need to take a day off and think about whether you want to work here. Um, that's a consequence for the way you've been treating people. Or um, I've consulted with high tech companies. They wonder, you know, we have a middle manager. We're wondering if we should fire her. She writes terrible emails and offends everybody. And so the consequence, I say, is give them coaching. 
give this person like three sessions of coaching and see if they can change their email behavior. And if they can, you may be able to keep them and get the benefit of their knowledge, et cetera. And if they can't, then you may need to move them on out of that division or out of your organization. So that's consequences. And I give several workplace examples with people being confronted. Here's the limit and here's the consequence if you violate it again. And sometimes they violate it again and the consequence has to happen. So that's uh, four strategies. Fifth is educate others and say, hey, look, this is what's going on. And this is a pattern of behavior. And so, of course, you're helping with that because you're interviewing me about the book. So you're educating others. Right. Um, but these are patterns of behavior that are hidden in plain sight. And I think the more people realize them. And when I do consultations and people say like, like my neighbor is a bully and I figured out that I said the wrong things, but then I read your book and now I'm going to say this instead. And so people, people can catch on pretty quickly to this stuff. We just haven't talked about it as a society. Like we talk about say alcoholism with everybody understanding alcoholism, society gets along a lot better. We can manage alcoholics and push them into treatment and they can, be recovering and do do great things. But with bullies, we don't really think that much about them. And I might add personality disorders, um, to some extent, the three I mentioned that some of them are bullies. Personality disorders, the diagnostic manual says are about 10% of adults. And this is kind of worldwide. And alcoholics are about 7% of adults, 7 or 8%. So this is a huge problem. And bullying is one of the aspects of it that we haven't addressed as a society and, and, and need to. We need to open our eyes and treat people not as jerks, but treat them as human beings who need to be restrained a bit and learn some better skills. That's the yeah. whole point of my yeah. And the very last, the sixth one is to stand with others, to support other people in stopping bullies. And I think like in the workplace that a bystander doesn't have to do a big confrontation, can just say, hey, cut it out, Joe, or hey, cut it out, Jane, or that's enough, or leave her alone. And that's all you have to do. You don't have to yeah. go into a personality analysis and complaint, just say, just cut it out. Stop it, yeah. And bullies often stop when they see bystanders not uh, tolerating what they're doing. Yeah, I think that's brilliant because especially during COVID, the emergence of Karens, everybody was recording them, posting them on social media, and people became like kind of cohesive about it and irate. And then all of a sudden, you don't see the Karens as much anymore, or videos of them. Yeah, and and people don't like to be exposed as acting badly, right? And and so you know, it doesn't take much to say, hey, you know, back off, or that's enough. And and we do learn as a culture. We do learn, like right. with alcoholism, we did learn. Um, so I think, you know, we can learn and have compassion. I think that's a, a problem people have. They say, oh, don't talk about their behavior. You know, they're not a bad person. And that's the thing is they're not a bad person, but they engage in bad behavior. We need the behavior to stop. But the person may be a big contributor. So it's the behavior is the problem. What do people do when they have uh, bullies in families, you know, it could be anybody, be your parents, could be anybody. How do you treat that type of situation? I think ideally that, that you, you get some counseling. Now, if it's physical, you know, there's child abuse or domestic violence, someone that's crossed that line into violence needs to get some, some kind of a program. Uh, and they're like a domestic violence perpetrator, there's good 
group treatment programs for that. People go like for a weekly meeting, an hour and a half a week for 52 weeks, a lot of them stop being physically abusive and actually learn to have some empathy for their partner and their children. It's, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous and stuff. People learn good skills for life. Mm -hmm. And so, so some kind of treatment. Same with child abuse. There's good treatment for physical child abuse. Um, that's one of the easiest things to treat, actually. Within a few weeks, you can help a parent that's been hitting their child not hit their child. So treatment like that. Um, but if it's more verbal, um, and I give an example in there as a narcissistic parent who, who, you know, as bullies do, split their kids. They, they polarize them against each other. You're the favored child and you're the idiot and, you know. And so that's family counseling can really help with that. As soon as people realize that, hey, let's get some counseling and some skills to manage our emotions better to use more flexible thinking, to manage our behavior, and, and people can grow and change, and we've seen that. I've worked a lot with divorcing families, so there it's really tricky because they no longer have the, the love for each other, but they may have children that they need to love and support each other around. And a lot of it's teaching them skills and counseling can be a big part of that. So is it okay to say to a bully something like, um, you're like in the moment when they're bullying you, like you're making me feel uncomfortable. I don't like bullying behavior. Can you mention that to them? Or is that just not a good idea as well? I think you can say exactly what you did without the word bullying is I don't like the way you're, you know, I don't feel comfortable with the way you're treating me, with your behavior towards me. And if you keep doing this, I'm going to have to walk away um, and end this situation, end this conversation and not solve the problem you wanted me to help you with. So don't treat me that way or don't use that behavior with me. I think that's the better way because once you say they're bullying then you trigger their defensiveness and ironically bullies have a very thin skin they oh, can yeah. dish it out but they can't take it right. and that's like the narcissistic overlap um yeah so i would say everything you did but without the word bullying how are they supposed to know though that they're bullies i mean at what point because like you said before, maybe people are just walking on eggshells around them and they have no idea that they're being bullying. Like how it, how are they supposed to know that, hey, you're a bully? Well, I think it's the consequences of their behavior that teaches them that. Now, if they went into counseling or let's say they were sent to me to do a consultation some, and they say, someone says, I'm... I'm being a bully in the workplace and I don't want to lose my job. Um, or we've had people that say, you know, I'm a high conflict person and I want to keep my job. What should I do? And in that kind of one to one consultation or counseling or coaching, I would say, well, you have a pattern that fits bullying and here's some ways to overcome that. And here's some skills you can develop and we can practice. And that's one thing we do a lot with our consultation and training is have people practice. Let's have a conversation. What upsets you that other people say to you and then you feel like yelling back at them? And they'll tell me, I'll say, okay, so let's pretend you're that person yelling and I'll pretend I'm you. And so you yell at me and I'm going to do some things. And so they yell at me and I don't react because I'm busy telling myself I can stay calm. I don't have to yell back. I'm doing OK. We call it encouraging statements. Mm -hmm. So I tell myself I'm doing OK. Then after they've done that, I say, OK, this is what I did. I was busy telling myself and my what I was telling myself was louder than what you were saying to me. So it didn't, didn't get through. 
and it didn't trigger me or upset me. So now let's switch roles here. I'm going to say the, the angry things that someone said to you, and you try telling yourself, just listen, you don't need to respond. Just we'll start with this. Are you ready? And they go, okay. And then I'll say, you know, you're always late and you don't know what you're doing, whatever it is. And they're telling themselves, they say, wow, it wasn't as loud because I was telling myself my encouraging statement. Mm. And so, so we can role play like that. And then I'll say, now let's practice what you can say. So you keep calm and then your response um, to what somebody says. And in some ways, teaching bullies how to respond like targets of bullies, which is you're making me uncomfortable and I need you to stop that behavior or I'm going to leave the conversation. Right. Just like you did. Yeah. You know, it's almost like they want you to become defensive because I notice with some of them, they, they start throwing these accusations at you. You know, you're this and you're that and it was your fault and you started it and, you know, you're the one yelling, not me. And then they want the response of you defending yourself. How do you get out of that? I think you don't get sucked in. In other words, don't don't defend yourself. If you're, and I teach professionals to use a skill we call ear statements. Mm -hmm. So you've got to keep yourself calm and give the person empathy, attention, or respect, E-A-R. And so they're coming at you saying, you know, Bill, you're incompetent. You don't know what you're doing. You haven't helped me at all. And so I want to say, yes, I have. You've had the best you could possibly get given who you are, but I don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> so instead I go, oh, wow, you're pretty upset about it. what's tell me more what's going on. I'll pay attention. I really want to understand your concerns. And they start talking and it's like they're worried about how their case is going or someone else in their life is giving them a hard time. And then I start understanding that they're reacting to something else. And then I can help them with that. And let's talk about how you could deal with that other situation. So for professional, I don't try to get the average person to do this and especially spouses. It's really hard to give empathy, attention and respect to an angry spouse right. when it's happening. But for professionals like counselors, lawyers, mediators, you can do this and it calms people down within 30 seconds um, because they feel heard and you're focusing on them, not defending yourself because you don't have to defend yourself from bullies. It's about them. They shouldn't be doing what they're doing. Right. It's not what you did. If they're yelling and screaming and throwing things because you were two minutes late, that's about them because, you know, it's, you can make mistakes. Humans yeah. make mistakes. Yeah, lot. I mean, I, I've, seen, I've seen it take place with like simple innocent statements and all yeah. of a sudden that would trigger the person and they would just go off on a some yelling binge and you know you're there in shock like what is happening here so the best thing to do is just to remain quiet and say your mantra and not react i think if that if you're going to react it's better to do that to just quietly tell yourself your mantra good way to put it um it's like oh wow you know, and just kind of listening. Right. And and they run out of steam pretty quick because anger back feeds them. Yes. And yes. also looking like a deer in the headlights feeds them. So you want to go, you know, maybe we should have a discussion of this. So you may want to say something like that. Um, or, you know, when, when you're ready, let's talk about this. Um, but not not try to match their emotional level um so they're up here and you're down here there's there's a thing i learned years ago that really fits this and that's about mirror neurons that we tend to mirror each other's behavior mm -hmm. but if they're going up here and you're down well, let's see which hand let's pretend this is yeah this is them and this is me if they're up here 
And I stay calm and give them an ear statement, say, wow, you're really upset. You know, this seems like something for us to talk about. They calm down. They mirror my response. They mirror my emotions. So by staying calm and engaged, don't, you know, disengage. You can look interested. Um, they often will mirror you. So you might say something if they're going off, like, you know, hey, you know, there's something we can talk about when you're ready. And then just kind of listen and sit there and remind yourself it's not about me. Um, that's my favorite one. Uh, some great. people like that. Other people have, like in divorce, they'll say, I am a good mother because their co-parent is saying you're a terrible mother and uh, I'm a good mother's louder than you're a terrible mother. And that helps them not react. Yeah, that's great. I, you know, it's so interesting when I read your book, it, it really made me wonder why we don't talk about this more. Like this should really be front and center. And, and when you said 10% of the population, I thought that number would be way higher. I don't know. The thing, the overlap, because I don't have numbers on high conflict personalities or bullies, but we do have numbers on the, the personality disorders. And the three I mentioned, uh, antisocial, narcissistic, and borderline, mm -hmm. are part of cluster B personality disorders in the diagnostic manual. Histrionic is the other one, and they're more dramatic than bullies, so Generally, I don't see them as that. Can we talk about that? Because I, I, I do, I have experienced histrionic behavior. So like, yeah. let's explain to folks what that is so they can identify that. Okay. Let me just finish and just say yep. those four together are considered 4.5% of the adult population. And so I say bullies may be around 5%. That's where I get that number. But they could be as much as 10 people that just have traits of those. But yeah, so histrionic personality is very dramatic, very emotional, and, and draws attention to themselves. And, you know, the, the best example I think of is the guy in the TV show, The Office. Um, my, my business partner, Megan, likes that show. And she said he's a classic histrionic guy, you know. And it could be a guy. People think of women as being histrionic, but men can be histrionic too. But it's, it's dramatic, it's exaggerated. Uh, think, oh my goodness, this is terrible when it's just a problem to solve. And so they're very exaggerated. And I think of like histrionic clients I've had as like pin cushions, is everything hurts. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Uh, and they're constantly reacting and, and life is just hard because they're so emotional with everything. And so trying to help them learn to be calm and things they can tell themselves is really important. But yeah, so that's a general picture. Yeah. And they say that that's one of the personalities in this cluster B that's dramatic, emotional, erratic. Um, but I don't see them as much as bullies, but I see them as distracting and and can be quite difficult, especially in families. Oh, yes, most definitely. So tell us, what, what exactly do you do at the High Conflict Institute? What do you offer, folks? <laughs> So we're basically an educational organization. Um, and what we do, we do a combination of things. So the biggest thing we do is train professionals. And so we're in our 16th year now. And I do about 60 trainings or presentations a year. I may speak to a group like last week, I spoke to federal mediators. Uh, who deal with a lot of labor management disputes for big companies, um, some government disputes, et cetera. And there's about a thousand people I presented to for an hour. And I taught them two particular skills to use in mediating disputes when high conflict people are there, which includes bullies. 
Um, then I also train people like I train uh, counselors to work with people going through divorce, high conflict divorce. So I have a 12 hour training program that I have them practice counseling sessions like role playing and then we discuss them and I give them tips and they practice some more. And we do a lot of this on Zoom. So we've got the breakout rooms and there's three people, maybe one's from Idaho and one's from Canada and one's from Australia and they're doing a role play family counseling session. Um, so, so we do training like 12 hour trainings. We do one hour presentations. I speak to a lot of uh, lawyers conferences. So there may be a statewide conference and I'll speak to them for six hours. Um, I'm doing more and more judges trainings now because they often see the high conflict people there in legal disputes and people are really upset with each other. Um, and they want to calm the conflict because they know it's not going to go away just because the judge made a decision. Then um, we do coaching. We've trained, we have coaches with High Conflict Institute, and we've also trained maybe 300 coaches with workplace coaching and uh, divorce coaching. Those are the two most high conflict areas. Then we have books. I, I have what I call compulsive writing disorder. <laughs> I write like a book a year, um, but I love it. And it's a way of teaching for me. Um, and then consultation. So people will come to us with any type of dispute like this, and I'll, I'll give them a consultation, like a neighbor dispute. How do I deal with my neighbor who's doing, you know, like they've rerouted their uh, drainage runoff so it floods my backyard um, or, you know, the dog never goes to sleep and barks in the yard or things like that, as well as a lot of workplace um, disputes. And of course, we do workplace training, but consultations. So my life right now is the, the speaking, uh, training, the consultation and the writing um and we have a few other speakers and a few coaches like i said um, but we're basically a an educational organization so like we don't represent clients in legal disputes mm -hmm. and we don't provide family counseling we train counselors and have a list and then other people pick from that list so yeah that's what we do education is is our thing Oh, awesome. So you don't do like one on one counseling, really? It's more. Corporate. Yeah, it's just consultation. So right. typically I'll do one to three sessions of consultation, which may include some role plays like that. But I wouldn't say it's a counseling relationship. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I did that for 12 years in the 1980s before I became a lawyer. And throughout I did mediation. But yeah, so we we encourage people to use our lists to find counselors in their state. And we have a lot of people, not in every state, but a lot of states. So these counselors, um, they're like one of, one of their specialties is maybe dealing with this topic. Is that. Or right. In other words, they, they have their counseling practice, but they also may do high conflict divorce counseling. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. And so, yeah, we developed a method for that. We call it new ways for families. So we train them in new ways for families, and then they add that to their list of services. And, and somebody's looking in their state for a counselor that does this. They look on our list, say, oh, okay, I'm going to call that person. And so, yeah, it kind of runs itself. So we train people, and then they're out there. Uh, nice. Spreading the their word, work. yeah. Yeah. So before you go, and I appreciate the hour that you spent with us, I wanted to just get your take on um, during the past four years, a lot of voices have been silenced and many of them have been bullies, um, whether they're being censored on X or Facebook, whatever the platform. What's your take on that personally? Do you think that we should delete these comments that bullies are leaving 
or does that go against our First Amendment speech rights? Like, what's your take on the whole thing? My my approach is that the most the biggest thing we have to do is develop personal skills at what to pay attention to and what to screen out. I don't see government really doing a good job of protecting us from other people's awful speech. Um, people used to protect each other from that, families, communities, so-and-so's a bully, don't listen to him. But now, you know, you're going to run into them. You're reading something interesting and suddenly there's a bully comment. So my, my goal is to help people be able to screen that out. And so individual skills is really my whole approach to this. Um, I think, I, I do think that the social media companies need to do better moderation. I know our own website, you know, so we get comments on our website, but we moderate that. And if someone says, you know, you people are idiots and don't know what you're talking about, we're not going to post that. It's, it's not necessary. It's not a contributing thing. If somebody says, you should add this to your work, or you've been omitting an important topic, or the way you talk about a certain topic makes me uncomfortable, I wish you would use this word instead of that word, sure, we we'll take criticism. Yeah. Absolutely. But we don't take bullying. And, and it's people learning where to find that line. Um, I really like that approach. So you're letting companies and people self-censor or censor their own platform rather than have the government do it for us. Yeah, that moderated. And, and there's some good ones, um, you know, that really put a lot of energy into moderating discussions. Within companies, there's a lot of that happening. And employees feel comfortable giving each other feedback, criticizing certain policies and procedures, because they're being listened to in a safe environment. Right. And, and that's, you know, the goal isn't to make everybody paranoid and scared. <laughs> right, right. And you know, free for all does that. The Wild West of the Internet, to some extent, has made everybody scared. Yeah. But I think you can find safe spaces and focus on them. And, you know, when people don't get attention for being bullies, they're not going to bully as much. Right. So I think that's, to me, that's the way to do it. And just let people know, look, that's bullying. Don't don't pay attention to that. That's not helpful. I really like that. So, um, of course, I'll have the links to your uh, website and your book in the description of this video, as well as running across the screen for folks. And if they leave any comments um, in in the in the chat. Uh, I'm sure maybe once in a while you can pop back in and answer them. Uh, you know, as time goes by, people like to ask questions. Hmm. Yeah, if, if there's a way to send me that. Oh, I could do uh, that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So what yeah, do you if I could, The easiest for me is you send me an email and say, here's a couple questions people okay. have. That and works. I'll send an email back that answers them. No, I oh. love answering questions. Brilliant, brilliant. So what, what are you, in closing... What are you working on now? What are you working on in the future? Anything exciting going on? Well, um, I'm, I'm promoting this book and educating people about it. And I've had over 30 interviews, including some TV and radio stations wow. and such. So I'm trying to do education around this book. I'm also doing um, uh, three, four session classes um, this fall on bullies dynamics in families, bully dynamics in the workplace, bully dynamics in communities, and how to deal with those. And those are listed on our website. So starting to do more classes around bullying. Um, otherwise, pretty much continuing on giving the, the trainings and presentations as requests come in. But I think expanding into this bullying area is, is going to be an important part of my work in the future because people can relate to the concept of bullying, whereas like high conflict personalities is more of something that 
lawyers and therapists and professionals deal with. Mm -hmm. But I want to reach I want to reach everybody because I think everybody could use the skills to manage these situations and everybody needs to feel safer and know what to do um, emotionally to feel okay. And that's today. what I really like about your book. You arm people with, you know, very powerful tools so that they can kind of do it themselves. Um, thank you so much, Bill. It was a, a pleasure speaking with you. And I, I, I think this is a topic, like I said before, that we need to really get out there and I'll do my best to help that. Well, thank you, Carol Ann, for all you're doing. And I really appreciated the interview. You, you're very comfortable and warm and encouraging, which is what people need to deal with bullies and all of this. So thank you so, thank much. You so much. Oh, and I hope we can touch base again moving forward because there's so many questions that, you know, we left unanswered. But I hope everybody grabs a copy of your book because I know they're going to love it as much as I did. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Bye-bye.